multinational corporations have a long and dark history of condoning tyrannical governments. Is it narcissism that compels them to seek their reflection in the regimented structures of fascist regimes? There was an interesting connection between the rise of fascism in Europe and the consciousness of politically radical people about corporate power uh, because there was a recognition that fascism rose in Europe with the help of enormous corporations. Mussolini was greatly admired all across the spectrum. Business loved him. Investment shot up. And suddenly when Hitler came in in Germany, the same thing happened there. Investment shot up in Germany. He had the workforce under control. He was getting rid of dangerous left-wing elements. Investment opportunities were improving. There was no problems. These are wonderful countries. I think one of the greatest untold stories of the 20th century is the collusion between corporations, especially in America, and Nazi Germany. First, in terms of how the corporations from America helped to essentially rebuild Germany and support the early Nazi regime. And then, when the war broke out, figured out a way to keep everything going. So General Motors was able to keep Opel going, Ford was able to keep their thing going, and companies like Coca-Cola, they couldn't keep the Coca-Cola going, so what they did was they invented Fanta Orange for the Germans. And that's how Coke was able to keep their profits coming in to Coca-Cola. So when you drink Fanta Orange, that's the Nazi drink that was created so that Coke could continue making money while millions of people died. When Hitler came to power in 1933, his goal was to dismantle and destroy the Jewish community. This was an enterprise so fast that it required the resources of a computer. But in 1933, there was no computer. What there was was the IBM punch card system, which controlled and stored information based upon the holes that were punched in various rows and columns. Naturally, there was no off-the-shelf software as there is today. Each application was custom designed and the engineer had to personally configure it. Millions of people of all religions and nationalities and characteristics went through the concentration camp system. That's an extraordinary traffic management program that required an IBM system in every railroad direction and an IBM system in every concentration camp. Now, this is a typical prisoner card. There are little boxes where all the information is to be punched in. We compare this information to the code sheet for concentration camps. And here you see Auschwitz is one, Buchenwald two, Dachau is three. Now, what kinds of prisoners were they? They could be a Jehovah's Witness for two, a homosexual for three, communist for six, or a Jew would be eight. Now, what was their status? One was released, two was transferred, four was executed, five was suicide, and six. Code six, Sonderbehandlung, special treatment, meant the gas chamber or sometimes a bullet. They would punch that number in, the material was tabulated, the machines were set, and of course, the punch cards by the millions had to be printed and they were printed exclusively by IBM and the profits were recovered just after the war. I really do believe that that particular accusation has been fairly discredited as a serious accusation. That is, the fact that they have used equipment, you know, that is a fact, but how they got it, how much cooperation they got, and any kind of collusion, trying to connect dots that are not connected, I think that's the part that is discredited. Generally, you sell computers and they're used in a variety of ways and you always hope they're used in the more positive ways possible if you ever found out they are used in ways that are not positive. 
then you would hope that you stop supporting that. But do you always know? Can you always tell? Can you always find out? IBM would, of course, say that it had no control over its German subsidiary. But here on October 9th of 1941, a letter is being written directly to Thomas J. Watson with all sorts of detail about the activities of the uh, German subsidiary. None of these machines were uh, sold. They were all leased by IBM, and they had to be serviced on site once a month, even if that was at a concentration camp such as Dachau Buchenwald. This is a typical uh, contract with IBM and the Third Reich which was instituted in, nine, in 1942. It's not with the Dutch subsidiary. It's not with the German subsidiary. It is with the IBM Corporation in New York. You know, as it happens, I know that story. I discussed it more than once with old Mr. Watson, and I was around at the time. I'm not saying that Watson didn't know that the German government used punch cards. He probably did know. After we had very few customers, Watson didn't want to do it. Watson, not because he thought it was immoral or not, but because Watson, with a very keen sense of public relations, thought it was risky. It should not surprise us that corporate allegiance to profits will trump their allegiance to any flag. A recent U.S. Treasury Department report revealed that in one week alone, 57 U.S. corporations were fined for trading with official enemies of the United States including terrorists, tyrants, and despotic regimes. You can roughly locate any community somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. For big business, despotism was often a useful tool for securing foreign markets and pursuing profits. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals, Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies, Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank. Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. fruit companies, and China for Standard Oil. General Butler's services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. But the country was not entirely behind the populist president. Large parts of the corporate elite despised what Roosevelt's New Deal stood for. And so, in 1934, a group of conspirators sought to involve General Butler in a treasonous plan. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government. But the corporate cabal had picked the wrong man. Butler was fed up with being what he called a gangster for capitalism. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A congressional committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. As today's chairman of Goodyear Tire knows, for corporations to dominate government, a coup is no longer necessary. Corporations have gone global. And by going global, the uh, governments 
have lost some control over corporations, regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted, governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and reigning oligarchs of our system. So capitalism and its principal protagonists and players, corporate CEOs, have been accorded unusual power and access. This is not to deny the significance of government and politicians, but these are the new high priests. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to attend this meeting that was being put together by the National Security Agency called the Critical Thinking Consortium. I remember standing there in this room and looking over on one side of the room, and we had CIA, NSA, DIA, FBI, Customs, Secret Service. Uh, and then on the other side of the room, we had Coca-Cola, Mobile Oil, GTE, and Kodak. And I remember thinking, I am like in the epicenter of the intelligence industry right now. I mean, the line is not just blurring, it's just not there anymore. And to me, it, it spoke volumes as to how industry and government were consulting with each other and working with each other. As 34 nations of the Western Hemisphere gathered to draft a far-reaching trade agreement, one that would lay the groundwork to privatize every resource and service imaginable, thousands of people from hundreds of grassroots organizations joined to oppose it. Canada's top business lobbyists and its chief trade representative discount the dissent in the streets. For them, the America's 800 million citizens speak with one voice. Nice to see you. Well done well. on your strong advocacy of uh, trust, truth, justice, wisdom, and all those things. Okay. I was looking yesterday at the statements at the inauguration, the opening ceremony. What, what an extraordinary progress Absolutely. over the last 15 years Absolutely. when you heard such a, open, com a common language. A common language. From Yes, and from the most developed to the least, it was uh, it was extraordinary that now that we see the benefits of trade, more and more people want to buy it Absolutely. because we do realize that it helps everyone, from the poorer to the better off. So a lot of these countries good. are not saying we want to get off; they want to get on. Exactly. So no one wants out. What it is, Everyone right. wants it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well done. So, Thank uh, you. Wow. Super. Super. So far, so good. Good. So far, good. So good. I'm inside and this is all outside, so that's, uh, that's the way it is. But it, uh... So what do you think when you look at all this? Well, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's too bad that, that, this has, uh, that this has erupted. Let's see. 